join us online and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would implore you, I'd beg you that today would be the day you trust Jesus Christ. His blood can cover your sin. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All right, and precious blood of Jesus Christ was he shed on the cross. And so that's why we're here, to celebrate what Jesus did for us, to worship God. It's all about the blood. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him, all right, and what he's done and what he wants to do. If you have your Bibles, if you would, please open to Esther in chapter number 5. Esther chapter number 5, as we continue our series in the book of Esther and the story of Esther. Last week we looked at a powerful verse that Mordecai, a powerful thought that Mordecai had challenged Esther with, and Esther responded. Mordecai had, had basically told Esther, who knows that it may be the reason you're where you're at is for this particular moment. We can't help but draw some similarities to 2020 and we look around us and who knows if we're not right here for such a time as this. The world's not getting any better, all right, but God is still good. You, as a child of God, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the life that everyone else searches for. You have the hope that everyone else needs. You have that in Jesus Christ. Now's the time to take that stand. Now's the time to share the gospel. Now's not a time to sit back. Now's the time. And who knows that God has put you where you're at for such a time as this. We live in an ever-changing landscape. Every day is a new day in 2020. Maybe you've seen some of those memes online waiting for the next year. I saw one the other day. I keep waiting for the new year to make sure this one leaves. The fact is we don't know what tomorrow holds. And we think maybe today may be bad. Tomorrow could be worse. But that's all right because God is still in control. I don't know about you, but I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm going to live forever. I'm living in heaven with Him forever. The best is yet to come. But last week we saw how Esther made a great resolve. She asked some things and then she said, And if I perish, I perish. A tremendous, in Esther chapter 4 verse 14 and and 15 and 16, a great resolve. A great resolve in the midst of great adversity. Our theme for this year, help me, it's on the side walls. What is it? I believe God. Would you say that with me again? Our, our theme for this year is I believe God. It's kind of what we're looking at all uh, Sunday morning long this year. We're looking at how Esther chose to believe God. I'm challenging us this year that we will make that choice. It was a resolve in the face of great adversity. A resolution that will affect great people, a great amount of people. And a resolution that she made that brought great responsibility. Boy, you can just picture her penning those words or passing that message back to Mordecai at the end of chapter 4. You can kind of, maybe, maybe you don't read the Bible this way, but I hear her say that with those words. This is what I'm going to do. You pray, and if I perish, I perish. And her back straightens up a little bit, and a little bit of maybe just like, here we go. And there are those moments in life when we decide to follow God by faith. And they're so important. The question I have this morning, the title of the message is, what happens next? What happens next? You see, we must understand that performance, action, must follow resolve. James says it this way, faith without works is dead being alone. True faith will always bring action. Or Henry Ford said this, you can't build a reputation based on what you're going to do. It's on what you do. Too many Christians are the coulda, shoulda, woulda Christians. Coulda come to church, coulda passed out a track, shoulda said that, and woulda done that if rather than to believe, receive, and achieve. Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War said he found many soldiers who were willing to sacrifice and shed their last drop. His words, but I can't find too many who will shed the first drop. Children around the house are always eager to help with the housework when they're too young to be much of a help. 
The more helpful they are, <laughs> the less. I tell you, I, my kids are at a stage now where, man, if I had known this, I would have had kids years earlier. We got back from vacation a week ago this past Friday. We pulled in and, boy, it was 6 o'clock at night. I had to unload the car. I said, all right, kids, let's get the car unloaded. And just a little while later, that whole thing was unloaded. I remember the days when I had to do all that all by myself. Brother Treadway, yours probably gets unloaded real quick now. That's right. Someone else said it this way, a little more profound. It's always easy the night before to get up early the next morning. That hits right at home, doesn't it? Tomorrow morning, I'm getting up early and I am. And tomorrow rolls around and that blasted alarm clock goes off. And all the plans, the best laid plans of mice and men at that point are for naught. I want to look at this morning as we look at Esther in Esther chapter 5. We're going to read the chapter. Look at her resolution and then look at what happened next. I believe there's some keys that will help us as we take that step of faith. If you look in chapter 5 of Esther. Now it came to pass. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. She was showing reverence. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. Let me pause there real quick. What? What a good stipulation. Esther, what, what is it that you desire? Whatever you desire, up to half of the kingdom. At that time, the greatest ruling power was King Ahasuerus of the Medes and the Persians, a Persian empire. Half of his kingdom was more than half of our goods, just in case you're wondering. If you came to me and said, Brother Howell, you can have anything you want of mine up to half of what I have, that would be so generous. But it would be a drop in the bucket to when King Ahasuerus said to Esther, I'll give you up to half of the kingdom. Well, he was in a very cordial mood that day. He was in a very giving mood that day. And what did Esther ask? Esther answered, verse number 4, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and the Haman come this day into the banquet that I have prepared for him. The king said, cause Haman to make haste, and he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee, and what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. Notice that's the same thing he said in verse number three. This king was no dummy. He, he, listen, this is not his first rodeo. He knew that Esther did not risk her life to invite him to a banquet. He knew something else was going on here. Well, we can relate to that, men. We know sometimes in our marriages that what is stated is not what is true. Honey, what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> May I encourage you men to ask the question one more time. But well, nothing's not nothing. Oh, he asked the question one more time, he did. Verse 7, then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in thy sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. She said, Would you humor me and would you come back tomorrow? This is worse than any commercial break ever known to man. Listen, come back tomorrow and I'll tell you. This is worse than trying to figure out on date night what restaurant to go to. Maybe you've been there before. Honey, my wife says you decide. Oh, no, no, no. You won't trick me this way. No, ma'am. When I was young and foolish, I'd make that decision. Honey, where would you like to go? Well, I don't care. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. You do care. Yes, yes. I, I've been down this road before. 
I learn something, men. I give options. Yeah? And whatever she leans toward, that's what I'm, fa- that's what I'm facing. Honey, do you feel like famous days? Oh, no, oh, me neither. That's a terrible place. Can't stand it. I don't know who would want to go to famous days. Honey, do you feel like Olive Garden? Oh, kind of. Yeah, you're right. You know, sometimes it's kind of good, sometimes it's kind of bad. You know, honey, you like Red Lobster? Oh, I love Red Lobster. Oh, it's my favorite restaurant. I just tease. My wife's very good about that. Maybe you've seen that online, though, where men, for, for, for date night, they have the big, like, this big spin wheel. All the restaurants just spin the wheel for that. Boy, that'd be genius. I mean, make a lot of money with that. King has asked her twice now, what's, what's the problem? What's your request? And Esther has not yet stated her true request. We know what's going on. But we know because of chapter 1, 2, and 3, and 4 what the request is going to be. We know that Esther is concerned for her life and the life of her people. She is not just here to be kind. She is not just here to to have a banquet with the king and, and Haman. No, she is here because God has wanted her here to save his people. All right, this is not by accident that she's where she's at. And you see the hand of God. Remember that someone said once, though the name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, the hand of God is all over the book of Esther. In your life and my life, the hand of God is all over our lives. Even when we don't see Him working, God is still at work in your life and in my life. You say, well, pastor, it doesn't look real good right now. That's okay. God's hand is still on your life and my life. You made it here safely, didn't you? God's hand is at work. You're still living, aren't you? God's hand is still at work in your life. You you, you have breakfast this morning, or at least you drink some coffee this morning. God's hand is still at work. You see here, he asked her again, and she says, would you come back? In verse 9, then when Haman forth that day, little side note in the story, little caveat. Those of you who know the story know what happens, but it's kind of a neat maybe twist. Haman went forth and he's joyful and with a glad heart. I went to a banquet with the king and the queen. No one else went to that banquet but me and the king and the queen. Did I mention the king and the queen were there at that banquet and that I also was in attendance? Did did I mention that to you? Maybe you didn't know that that there was uh, an event that happened and that the king and queen were there and uh, yeah, well, I had to be there too. Uh, just, just us three, all right? Not even us four, no more, us three. All right, and no more, no less. Pride of Haman, you see. A little bit of honor, he thought. But when Haman, verse number 9, saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told him of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Now, verse number 11 just makes me kind of chuckle. Haman gets home. He calls his counselors and his wife, Zeresh, And he begins to talk about himself. He says, all right, honey, you sit there. Men, you sit there. Now listen, I'm a very rich guy. He talks about the multitude of his riches. Man, I am so rich. There's not many people richer than I am. He's telling them, these people who are as close and his wife, how rich he is. And about his children. Well, can you believe, can you believe all that I have? And they have to sit there and listen to him. And smile and nod. What a job. As he talks and brags in himself, and he begins to complain. In verse 12, Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king to the banquet that she had prepared but myself. Did I mention it was just the king and the queen and myself? And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou and merrily with the king into the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. This morning, with God's help, I want to look at this concept, this idea. What happens next? 
After Esther made this great resolution, after she said, all right, here we go. I'm going to follow God. I believe God. You pray. I pray. What happens next? Because sometimes, Christian, sometimes, friend, we're just full of hot air. You ever been guilty of that before? Great plans, great resolution, great thought of faith. But it's empty. What happens next? Lord, I pray you'd help us in the next few moments as we look at this passage. Lord, we look at Esther and we see some things that she did. Lord, may they help us. May they be a challenge to us. Lord, may they help us follow you. Lord, would you use us? We need you now more than ever before. Lord, maybe right now, maybe we realize it a little bit more. Lord, we don't need you any less. We did yesterday, but we realize it more now, Lord. I pray you'd use us this morning. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at this morning. Three actions that Esther took. Three actions Esther took that I think we can also take in our life and nothing but help, for, help to us. I want you to look, first of all, and the first one is an obvious one. It's a, it's a seemingly simple one, but it's profound. At the end of chapter 4, Esther asks for Mordecai to gather all the Jews in Shushan and himself. She said, will you fast for three days and neither eat nor drink? What she's saying is, she goes, would you fast and would you pray to the God of heaven that God will do something? The first action after we take a step of faith is this, prayer. Prayer. To pray. To spend some time with God. It was not odd to me, but it's no surprise and, and no coincidence that the last few messages as we've looked at God's Word in Esther and in the book of John have been on prayer. Maybe, maybe, just maybe God is calling out His people, all right, to spend some time in prayer. And by His people, I mean the folks at First Baptist Church. The unsaved will not spend the time in prayer that you and I ought to and have to. Can we say it this way? May all our solutions begin with prayer. How often have you lost something and you look and then you pray after you can't find what you're looking for? May our solutions begin with prayer. I challenged you last week. Have you prayed for the governor? Have you this past week prayed? I've prayed for her. I've prayed for her. She needs wisdom. Just like you and I need wisdom. And, and my Bible says that if I ask for wisdom, God will give it to me. May all our solutions begin with prayer. It was a serious prayer. It was serious. This was no ordinary prayer time. She had just said, if I perish, I, pray, I perish. Basically, I'm going and I may die. If that won't cause you to pray seriously, what will? This was a matter of life and death. But that's what prayer can do. D.L. Moody said, I'd rather be able to pray than be a great preacher. So D.L. Moody said, he said, Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. Prayer, it's serious. Dr. Curtis Hudson said this, there's more that you can do after you pray, but there's nothing that you can do until you pray. I've been driven down to my knees many times by overwhelming conviction. Nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and all that about me seemed insufficient for the day until I pray. Someone said it this way, life is fragile. Handle with prayer. So the first step that Esther took was some serious prayer. Serious prayer. I'll remind you again and challenge you again. I hope there's some things that you pray for that you will see God work with. There are things that I pray for that I don't tell anybody else about because I want to know that my God hears me. I'm glad He hears you, all right? And I, and I want Him to hear you. But I want my God to hear me when I pray. There's some things that I only pray for that I don't tell my wife, I don't tell my kids, I don't tell the pastoral staff, I don't tell the church. I'm just praying for them. So when God answers them, and He has over and over and over again, He's answered my prayer request. My God can hear me and your God will hear you say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever had God answer my prayer request. Well, he says, trust me and try me. You can prove the Lord. You can put him to the test. Why don't you pray for something? Say, God, I want to hear you. I want to know that you're my God. You're my Heavenly Father. Tr try him. Test him. He'll answer your prayer request. I promise you, because he promises you that he will. And, and there ought to be things that you pray for that no one else knows. So when God answers your prayer request, you know that your God hears you. 
Esther's praying some serious, serious prayer. Now, there are times that we pray in a corporate setting. There's times we ask for others to pray with us, and I have no problem with that. I think that's biblical. I think we ought to do that. We ought to pray for requests and let our requests be made known in in a corporate setting and have as many people sometimes as possible praying for something. We got a request the other day from Chad and Marcia Shear. The request that their son Wyatt, his girlfriend, may, may have a situation with some health issues and asked us to pray for him. So we prayed for him as a family and prayed this morning in Sunday school. I have no problem with that. That's good. But there ought to be some times and some things that you pray for. So God answers your request. I'll tell you there's a word of testimony. When I started challenging the church this way, many of you have come up to me and said, Pastor, I did that. And let me tell you what God did for me. And let me tell you something, as your pastor, when you tell me that, you may not realize this, but your face is lighting all the way up. Because there's something about that when God answers your request. When you know that God listened to you, that cannot be taught, it can only be caught. I can tell you about it all day long, I tell you what God has done for me, what He's answered mine, but when you see it, there's nothing, nothing like it. I've told you about with my kids, God's done it for my kids, and greatest lesson I could ever help them with as, as a dad in that sense for prayer boy I, I could tell them that God hears them but they got to see it serious prayer we take the step of faith but then how about some prayer Esther begins to pray and she prayed for three days there and fasted it was serious it was sacrificial it was sacrificial and it was significant the story goes that five young college students spent a Sunday in London. They were anxious to hear some well-known preachers. They found their way on a hot Sunday to Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon's tabernacle. While they were waiting for the doors to open, a stranger came up to them and said, Gentlemen, would you like to see the heating apparatus of the church? Apparently they were not particularly anxious to see the broiler on such a hot July day, but not wanting to be rude, they followed this stranger to where a door was thrown open in the basement. And there gathered over 700 individuals praying for the service that morning. Why was that church great? Because of the power of God. Why do I believe God's power was there? Because those people who prayed for it. Their guide was Charles Spurgeon, by the way, the stranger who showed them that. Early years of a seminary needed $10,000 to keep the work open. Harry Ironside was a lecturer there at that school, at seminary. And he prayed one day, he said, Lord, we need $10,000. Would you sell a few of the cattle on the hill for our $10,000 need? As the story goes, the next day a check showed up in the mail for $10,000 with this note. Had some extra cattle and we sold it. Hmm. What can your God do? What can my God do? Anything. Anything. Nothing is impossible for God. And it began with prayer. So you have a step of faith. You take the step of faith. Next step, maybe you ought to spend some time on your knees. Some serious sacrificial and significant prayer. There wasn't just prayer, though. Esther, I believe, second of all, she paid attention. She paid attention. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but when she goes before the king, she says that I have prepared a banquet. During these three days, she kind of put a plan together a little bit. We'll look at that in just a second. But where did she come up with this? she that smart? she just a brilliant person? Or maybe because of her, of her giving herself to God in, in the sacrifice and in the fasting and the prayer, maybe just maybe God answered like he says in James chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask if God would give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. You see, we need to look for God to reveal Himself. Understand this, God is more concerned about you knowing His will than you're concerned with it. You say, well, Pastor, I'm really concerned. God is more concerned. How do you know that? Well, it was His idea for the Bible, not our idea. It, it, was, it was His idea. It, he gave us His book. He wants us to know His will for us. 
It was His ideas about answering us when we pray. Not our ideas, though we would have asked for God to answer us. He says He'll answer us. His idea. His promises about what His Word does and how He'll reveal Himself. You see, we need to look for God to reveal Himself and listen as God reveals Himself. We need to be in tune to the voice of God. Have you heard God speak in your life? Can He whisper in a still small voice or does He have to use a two-by-four in your life? I don't want God to use a two-by-four. I want God to whisper and speak and me listen. Oh, there's that old story about the fellow stuck on the roof. You've heard it. Stuck on the roof and the flood water's coming up. Man dr- comes up in a rowboat, says, jump in the boat. He says, no, I prayed about it. God's going to rescue me. And the rowboat goes on. A little while later, you know the story, a motorboat pulls up. Sir, let me, let me rescue you. No, I prayed to God and I'm going to wait for him to rescue me. And the motorboat pulls on. A little while later, as the water rises higher, a helicopter shows up. Apparently, they shout out the helicopter, here, jump on this, this rope. And he says, no, I prayed to God. He'll rescue me. And the helicopter flies off. You know how it goes. And before long, the water goes above the house and the man drowns. Goes to heaven. Says, Lord, I pray you didn't answer my prayer request. Of course, you know how it goes. The, the Lord says, of course I did. I sent you a rowboat, a motorboat, and a helicopter. What's wrong with you? But Christian, sometimes that's how we are. <laughs> well, the Lord makes it real plain. We're like, is that really what you're saying to me? Is that really what you mean? I want what's behind door number B instead. The problem is not God's answer. It's what we're in tune with. Our radio, our spiritual radio is not tuned up very well. And so listen as God reveals himself. He'll speak to you if you listen. He'll speak to you. If you pray and seek his face, he'll speak to you through his word. He'll speak to you sometimes through godly influences in your life. Sometimes through the messages, through the preaching of God's word. He'll speak to you if you listen to him. Boy, there's hardly any sermons I come here where I get to listen. I love the Tuesday nights. In fact, we have Pastor Todd here this morning on vacation. He came to church on vacation. Amen. Warren, you, when you're on vacation, you ought to go to church as well. Oh, I should say that one more time. When you're on vacation, you ought to go to church as well. But I appreciate it, Pastor Todd preaching this last Tuesday night. What a helpful, powerful message. Many of you texted me and said it, it touched your heart in very specific ways. Praise the Lord for that. Listen, God will speak to you. If you listen, He'll speak to you. I say, well, sometimes, well, Pastor, I prayed five minutes. I didn't hear anything yet. Wow. Five minutes. Stay at it. Pray a little bit longer. Maybe He'll answer at minute number six. Week number two. Year number four. Nothing's too hard. He will answer. Listen to the voice of God in your life. Oh, he speaks to us. He convicts us. Sometimes he tells us when we're just idiots. We're just making wrong choices. He says things like, stop that. He'll say things like, is that really how you want to treat your wife? Right? He does that, doesn't he? The message is through his word, the Holy Spirit. Pay attention. After faith, pay attention. Pay attention to what God has. Pay attention to what He wants to do. Pay attention to what He's doing. See the hand of God. We can see it with Esther. She walked in there and she lived. She thought she was going to die. That's why in the middle of chapter 4, she didn't want to go before the king. She says to Mordecai, I haven't been called 30 days. I can't go in there. I will not survive this encounter. She did. She did, right? Not only survived, but survived it with flying colors. Can I just pause for a moment? Sometimes our minds build up scenarios that aren't true. Maybe it's just my mind, right? You worry about a problem. You worry about how it's going to be solved. And before you know it, the problem is so big and the world has ended, all right? There's nuclear holocaust. And we're like, fine, that's it. All right, Lord, then I'll just perish that way. I'm dead. I'm out of here. I'm done. Our minds go 100 miles an hour. You can lay in bed at night sometimes. Mind just going. Thousand directions. Not usually a good direction, right? It's not usually a positive route normally, right? When your mind goes that way, it's normally. And and Esther was there, but, but she paid attention and she took the step of faith. We see prayer, pay attention. Last thing is this, preparation. 
preparation. I like what verse number 1 of chapter 5 says. Would you look there with me? Now it came to pass on the third day, remember she said she'd, she'd do this for three days, that Esther put on her royal apparel, apparel and stood in the court of the king's house. You know what Esther did? She got dressed in her royal clothes and went to the king's court. Let that sink in. That's a powerful truth. She put on the right clothes and stood where she was supposed to go. Or she just did what she was supposed to do. You see how simple it is, yet so profound. It was a personal preparation that she had. She got ready. You know what? I knew this morning. I believe, God, that God wanted me in church. I knew that today. I chose to be in church, but I had to get up. If I hadn't have gotten up, I wouldn't be here in church. I'd still, you see the connection there? If I had stayed in bed, I would still be in bed. All right? So what did it take for me to put action to my faith? It took me getting my feet out of bed. Some days that's harder than others, right? It's not complex. You throw one leg out, then the other leg out. Right? There's some personal preparation. Then, you know what I did? Then I took a shower and got dressed to come to church today. And you should be so thankful that I did. I didn't have to pray to take a shower. I knew that's what I was supposed to do. Right? And I knew I was supposed to wear clothes to church. All right? The generally accepted thing, you wear clothes to church. What I'm saying is in the personal preparation, just do what you're supposed to be doing. All right? You know what you're supposed to do. You, you get out of bed. I knew God wanted me in church. I knew that God wanted me to spend some time with Him. So I did. How hard was that? Well, it was difficult. I sat in my chair. I opened up, I read off my phone this morning, I opened up my phone to my Bible app and I read God's Word. Boy, it wasn't real complex. See, sometimes we want to make it so complex and, and so convoluted. This preparation, what Esther did was she put on her royal apparel and stood in the king's court. You say, Pastor, I'm following God, what do I do? Get up tomorrow, spend time with God, pray a little bit, put on the right clothes, go to work, you're supposed to go to work, go to church, you're supposed to be in church. A few years back, about 13 years ago now, a pastor asked if I'd be principal of Bridgeport Baptist Academy for one year. One year is what he said, Mrs. Zillette. One year. Twelve years later, I handed off to Pastor Golemez, and I loved it. I had no regrets. I loved being in the school. The staff was great. The students were tremendous. Boy, blessing. But that first year, a little nervous. New principal, about 26 years old. You say, I was nervous. Mrs. Dalton, she was more nervous than I was. You know, this crazy kid in the office, what's he doing? I knew that God wanted me to be principal, so what did I do? I looked at principal things. Really. I read some material, studied, tried to study, tried to plan out how to be a principal. Right? I didn't know what I was doing, so I figured I could kind of look for some wisdom. All right, that's what I'm talking about, some preparation. It's not a hard thing. I want to be a good husband. So sometimes I read books on marriage. Why? I want to be a good husband. Not as much as my wife wants me to be a good husband, but I want to be one, at least partially the way. You can read the Bible and read how to be a good husband. The personal preparation. A simple yet profound truth. Just take the next step. I don't know what to do, Pastor. Good. Well, let me help you. Go home, eat lunch, and then come back to church tonight. That's the next step. It's not, not real difficult. Then what do you do? Well, then you, you go to your job on Monday morning. You be a good testimony and you be a good witness. You share the truth of the kingdom of God. You take the next step. What do you do Tuesday? You come back. Church Tuesday night. Get that tank recharged. Brother Brian McBride will be here. It'll be a blessing to you. Personal preparation. You say, well, pastor, that's not very profound. Yeah, but how many people miss it? How many people miss it? Oh, I can't get there. I can't get to church. I'm not talking about right now, and we still have some people at home, and that's fine. I've told you before. You, you come when you're ready, and there's no pressure on that. I'm not talking about that. All right, but you can watch it, can't you? You can turn it on. There's personal preparation. But then there was some planning. Did you catch in verse number four, when she told King Hazarius, he said, what do you want to have for the kingdom? She said this. She said, would you come to the banquet that I have prepared? It was already ready. 
That means she didn't wait for his response. She already had this in motion. There was some planning that went on. Her, her plan, there was two banquets. You see, walking by faith does not always mean not having a plan. Now, God can change my plan. He changes my day almost every day of the week, but I always got a good plan. I've got a plan to raise my children. I've got to walk by faith. I, want to, I have a plan, though. I want them to be respectful and to be obedient, right, to, to be spiritually minded. That's a plan. God can change it, but I have a plan. Has God given you a plan yet? Get a plan from God. Look at God's Word. She came with a plan. The preparation came with a plan. I don't know what I'm going to do. My friend, you're lost then. You're in trouble. All right? There's a plan right there. And you see that as, as she let it orchestrate it and play it out. We have a plan for the church. We want to live by faith. We've got a plan for the church, though, don't we? We try to pay our bills. That's a plan. Last, there was a purpose. There's a purpose there. I read a little bit about Mordecai. Interesting side note, just to kind of help us a little bit. Mordecai, who by the earthly markers was very successful, right? He was at a banquet with the king and the queen, right? That I mentioned just, just the king and the queen were there in Mordecai. Did I mention that? Yeah, he was right there, right? But what happened? I'm sorry, Haman. I'm about Haman, not Mordecai. Haman. Haman was there. I'll get there. Help me here. Haman was there, right? But he saw Mordecai and he got off track. Notice this, that make sure your heart is in the right place. When your heart is off, little matters bring misery. Now, Haman was not a Christian. Haman is a pagan, all right? Haman is against God, against God's people. And he's not saved. But I think there's a lesson to be learned there. When our heart's not right, a little matter becomes a big deal. Everything, according to Haman, was going great, but one little thing didn't go the way he wanted to, and boy, he was right in the dumps. I've seen Christians that way, blessed with a wonderful family, blessed with a beautiful house, blessed with all these material blessings, and one little thing goes sideways. And what do we focus on? What goes sideways? That's where our eyes go. That's where our attention goes. Be careful. There's purpose there. See, after faith, there's a step. All throughout the Bible, God asks us to do something because of our faith. This is not a new concept to Esther. Abraham, God came to him and said, Abraham, I want you to go somewhere else. He said, sure. Good, Abraham. Now start tearing your tent down and get moving. Children of Israel, going to the promised land. All right, here we go. Good. Now start walking. Naaman, you got leprosy, I'm going to heal you. Great. Start dunking yourself in the water. Widow of Zarephath, I'm going to provide for you. By faith, you can believe me. Start baking. And Esther takes a step of faith. All throughout the Bible, we see this pattern. That when we make a choice of faith, what's next? The next simple thing step. Christian, my friend, this morning, I want to ask you, where's your faith? Are you taking that next step? Have you taken the next step? I don't know what it may be for you. It may be as simple as getting out of bed. It may be as simple as opening up God's Word. It may be as simple as sharing the gospel. It may be as simple as praying and spending some time in prayer. It may be as simple as preparing. But every time that our faith toward God takes a step of action to show the true faith. Show me your faith without your works, as James says, and I'll show you my faith by my works. What does God want you to do next? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this account here of Esther. Lord, I pray that you'd challenge us Lord, may we not just say what is right, but Lord, may we live what is right. And one of this mornings you're here, maybe God touched your heart. Maybe there's a decision that you've made, but you've not taken the next step. As simple as it may be, 
Maybe you're still stuck in your mind. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've looked for your own solutions and not spent the time in prayer. Let's say this morning, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. And there's a step I need to take. Would you pray that I take that step with God's grace and help? I want my faith to have the action with it. Who's here this morning? I said, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me? Just a moment when you pray. Just slip your hands, slip back down. We'll see it. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. Amen. Who else? Pastor, that's me. All right. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who if you die today, you don't know that you'd go to heaven. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? Slip your hand up, slip back down. We'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. We'd love to pray for you and open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. Say, that's me. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know what you do in their hearts. I pray you touch hearts this morning. Lord, help us to take the step and do what's right as we follow you and believe you. Lord, bless the invitation. And those who have never trusted you as your Savior, Lord, would they trust you today in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand our feet for invitation, the altar is open. God touched your heart. You come. You know, someone to pray with you. We have men and ladies at the front who can pray with you. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. But you come as God's prompted you to piano plays. that you hold tomorrow. Lord, thank you that we can trust you and follow you. Lord, help us to live each day in light of your word and your path for us. Lord, thank you for all you've done. Lord, thank you for your grace and strength. Bless these folks here as they follow you. In Jesus' name.